everyone. So excited you could be here with us for our event. Um, we're delighted you can join us for our program from darkness to light to discuss the journey from the Holocaust to Israel. With us today, we have the president of the Holocaust Documentation Center, the deputy consul general of Israel in Miami, and Holocaust survivors to share what Israel means to them. Leading our program, we have the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and president of the Holocaust Documentation Center, Rosita Kenningsberg, born in the displaced persons camp of Bindermelch in Austria and the founding chair of the first children of Holocaust survivors group in 1981 in South Florida, Mrs. Kenningsberg has been a part of the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center for over 35 years. She is responsible for authoring and lobbying the Florida statue 1003.42 into law and ensuring and ensuring the teaching of Holocaust education for all of South Florida students. Rosita she is clearly an incredible woman. Rosita, please take it away. Thank you so much, Carol, for your kind words and very generous introduction. I wish to take a moment to mention that Carol Kaplan, the director of Academic and Jewish Affairs at the Office of the Consul General of Israel in Miami is incredible. I want to thank her for all of her efforts in helping make today's program possible. And please know that we very much look forward to working together again with you once again in future endeavors. Thank you so much, Carol. Good afternoon. And again, my name is Rosita Ehrlich Kenningsberg. And as president of the Holocaust Documentation Education Center, I too am so delighted to welcome all of you to today's featured program, From Darkness to Light, From the Holocaust to Israel. Before we begin, and I understand there are over 200 participants with us today, and many of you are new to the center, I thought it would be appropriate to take a moment and tell you a little bit about the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center. The center has come far in 40 years. What began on the North Campus of Florida International University in 1980 as a non-sectarian, non-profit organization rooted in what we call eyewitness testimony with a primary focus on Holocaust education is today a foremost institution of memory and purpose. And it's focused on finishing right now the first South Florida Holocaust Museum. This museum is slated to become a world-class legacy of remembrance and hope that we know will forever bear witness to the authentic memory and truth of the Holocaust. Our museum is housing and displaying and featuring the 2,500 eyewitness tape testimonies, the extensive collection of 8,000 documents, photographs, and artifacts, and our two major anchor artifacts, one, an authentic Holocaust rail car restored to its wartime state, and only for us to find out that this particular rail car transported men, women, and children from the Warsaw ghetto to the Treblinka death camp. And in addition, since we are talking about the rail car as the tragedy, the triumph, there is no way we were not going to have a U.S. Army M4A3EH Sherman tank of the type used to liberate the Dachau concentration camp so we can also celebrate the victory. An interactive media and resource and reference center with a resource library and over 6,000 volumes of books. And we are already using our state-of-the-art video facility to interview the many eyewitnesses that still are coming forward. And as a matter of fact, before the shutdown, we had interviewed a 103-year-old survivor and she was amazing. Her daughter said she didn't remember what she had earlier in the morning for breakfast, but she remembered her details and we were, it was just incredible. We are also doing a pilot program that will begin shortly on interviewing the second generation. 
we will have, and we have traveling exhibition space, which continues for those of us that have been with us bringing in the latest and foremost exhibitions to our community. And now we are featuring Israel Then and Now, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. We will also chronologically tell the story of the Holocaust. And at the end, we know we will leave our visitors challenged and changed. The museum, for those of you who've asked us, is age appropriate for students that are 11 years and older. And according to our world-class museum designer, Patrick Gallagher, this museum will take a multimedia interactive approach, combining all our invaluable precious holdings and collections that we have painstakingly collected for this purpose over all of these 40 years. And as a generation of our beloved survivors age, and their stories, as we know, only too well. We read about it, unfortunately, almost every day, if not every second day, that are being denied, distorted, and judicized. Building this museum right now and finishing it could not be more urgent and timely. If you are interested in visiting us or learning more about us, please visit our website at hdec.org. And now to the part that I am so honored and privileged and so thrilled um, to be able to have this opportunity today to introduce the Deputy Consul General, Casa Bainse Harbor. Deputy Consul Casa previously served as the Deputy Head of Mission at the Israeli Embassy in Wellington, New Zealand. And before being assigned, to New Zealand, Casa served as the deputy head of mission at the Israeli embassy in Yangon, Myanmar. Wow. Casa holds an MA from Tel Aviv University in the field of public policy and a BA from Hebrew University in the field of international relations. She is fluent in Amharic, Hebrew, and English. On behalf of all of us, here today and at the Holocaust Center, we thank you so much, Casa, and your entire staff at the consulate in Miami for your extraordinary commitment to the legacy and remembrance of the Holocaust. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you so much, uh, Rosita. I'm really happy to be here with you. And thank you so much for Jody, Norman, and Magna, and thank you, Carol, for making it happen. And I'm really happy to be here with you. It is an, a really an exciting day um, to hear your story and the story of the state of Israel and what the state of Israel means for all of us. So it's really um, an amazing job that you're doing, Rosita. Is, uh, so really, God bless you. You're doing such a great job. Um, and this is a wonderful uh, time for us uh, to celebrate um, our history and to celebrate our country, Israel, it's, it's the home of the Jewish people. Uh, I can tell that I am I'm an Ethiopian origin. I was born in Ethiopia as a Falasha or Ethiopian Jew, or, or uh, the way we call ourselves Beta Israel. Uh, the dream to, call, to go back to home to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, it was for thousands of years. And, and what, when we talk about Jewish people, you cannot, uh, talk about Jewish people without talking about the state of Israel or Jerusalem. And this is where this dream of every Jew in every corner of the world next year in Jerusalem. And this is what we used to say also in Ethiopia. And the fact that I am today speaking with you, Jody, Norman, and Magda, and talking about the state of Israel and how it's our birthright place. Not only that, this, this is our home. And the fact that we would be able to restore our home and to return to our home, it's, it's, it's just a miracle itself. So for me, I'm so honored to be here with you and to talk with you uh, about it. So um, just to, when I was a, a child in Ethiopia, I had no idea there are other communities that, <laughs> you know, with the same faith or, or the same hope like me to return to, to Jerusalem. And now that I, grown up and, and I'm Israeli and uh, I saw a Jewish community so almost in every corner in the world it's it is really a wonderful miracle and it's I think this our secret it's it's our hope and the and the ability to help each other so 
and this helping to each other. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, a diplomat for the state of Israel, and to, to be your assistance in anything that you guys need. Rosita and Megna and Norman and Judy and everything that you need. Recently, we handed over a face mask with the Israel logo. <laughs> Hopefully we will be able to, uh, to give more and, and to see how we can help um, you guys. So with the fact that we uh, restore our home, the fact that we reestablished our, our home, our land, Israel, is it's just the basic thing that every nation should have. It's our home, it's our land. So it doesn't matter if you right now live in Israel or outside of Israel, but every Jewish person in every corner of the world knows that he has a home. And, and if God forbid something happen, Israel will always open the doors for every Jew to, to come, it's, it's best right. Okay, so this is an amazing um, uh, thing in a Jewish history for after thousands of years, the idea, just the idea itself that a Jewish person can ha can back to his home, not only to go back to his home, Israel, but also has the ability to defend itself. It's unheard of. So that's why it's a miracle. It's the, the the time that we are living. It's a miracle itself. So the fact that there is a diplomatic relation or or institute of Israel here in the United States, it's amazing. And and many and more than ninety countries all, all over the world, we have a diplomatic relations. So we are strong, we are independent, and we are proud. And we are so proud of you. And we are so privileged and we're so happy to have you here. And we're so happy to, to be to your assistant here. So if anything, anything that you need from us, we are here from you. So I just want to say thank you very much for, uh, um, for you know, being with us today. Uh, we are very lucky and uh, you know, just I'm just telling my family, about this program that I'm doing today, that we're doing here at the consulate. And for me, it was when I talk about it, I had tears in my eyes. I say, I'm a diplomat for the state of Israel. I was born in Ethiopia, wishing to go back to, to Jerusalem. And now I'm here a diplomat and, you know, helping you and, um, and, and building the relationship. And for us, it's just an amazing. And it's just show us, you know, how the sentence Am Israel High is so strong in every generation, the holder of a door in every generation, Am Israel High and our hope and our faith is so strong. And our country, Israel is so strong, our home. So I'm so happy to be here with you again. And um, thank you very much for having me. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Rosita? One second, Rosita. Thank you so much, Casa. I have to tell you, when I hear you speak, I get very emotional as well, because just looking at all of us here today is a miracle. Because if we look at all the survivors, and I'm going to uh, you know, talk about them in their bios, the fact that they survived what they survived is, is unreal. The fact that you were in Ethiopia, I remember years ago, um, being on one of the first missions that went to Israel that greeted the Ethiopians that came off the plane. And I remember them walking down the steps of the plane and kissing the ground, and we greeted them. And to have you here today representing that kind of hope and what Israel is all about is extraordinarily wonderful, along with our survivors. It shows us our strength. And like you say, we are here. We are going to be here. There's our famous song, Zogna Kemal, as du geist im letzten Weg, which is never say this is your last road, your last time. We are here, and we are here to stay. And being a daughter of survivor, if my dad wouldn't survive, I wouldn't be here. So there's a rhyme, a reason, and a purpose. So thank you. And uh, just amazing. This is everything we stand for and represent. So this brings me to the next uh, part of the program. And I'd like to share with everyone, in case you don't know, South Florida is home to the second largest survivor population in North America. And I always say, if you took the poll probably in January, February, we probably have the number one because everybody comes to, some, to South Florida at that time of the year. 
It is also the third largest worldwide after Israel. Israel is number one and New York is second. For over these past 40 years, every one of our beloved survivors that has worked with us at the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center has done so with such tremendous passion, devotion, commitment, regardless how difficult or how painful they have kept the memories of the Holocaust alive. And they've always ensured that the lessons would be relevant and pertinent to the tens and thousands of teachers and the hundreds and thousands of students they come in contact with. They have impacted them over these many years. They have challenged each of them to stand up and speak out and understand that promises of never again after the Holocaust are empty and meaningless if one remains silent and indifferent in the case and in the face of adversity. And why do they do this? Very simply, the survivors do not want what happened to them to ever again happen to this or any future generation. We love them, we honor them, we cherish them. They are members of our extended families. We will always be in awe of their courage, their conviction, their fortitude, their resilience, their strength, their compassion. I could go on and on. Our survivors are our heroes. And now that it is the 21st century, they are our 21st century heroes. They are our mentors, our sages, and we only pray they continue to go from strength to strength. The birth of the state of Israel is a very pertinent topic in the study of the Holocaust. And especially so, as we could only imagine for all our survivors and in particular the three with us today. Scholars have stated, and I quote, that the Holocaust was definitely a contributing factor to the timing and circumstances of the struggle for the birth of the state of Israel. Our beloved Holocaust survivors will tell you to this day, and I quote one of them in particular, and he said, if there was a state of Israel, we and our families would have had a home to go to never would we have been turned away from the shores of our home during the Holocaust and our families would have survived. Today, we are truly blessed and honored to have with us three of our South Florida survivors who will each share with us what the state of Israel means to each of them. I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order and I'm gonna start with Magda Bader. And you will see her introduction up on the screen as well. Magda was born in Munkac, Czechoslovakia. She was the youngest of 10 children. She was nine when the war broke out. Her parents earned their living in the custom tailoring business. They were a middle-class family. Magda remembers being called Dirty Jew. And while walking in the street, she remembers seeing young boys in Prague wearing the uniform of the Hitler Youth after the Hungarians came to power in Czechoslovakia in 1937. Many restrictions followed. Jews had to wear the yellow star. There were curfews and travel was restricted. Jews could only listen to certain radio stations. On Passover, April 1944, at the age of 14, she and her family, except for her brothers, were put into the Munkac ghetto where they stayed for only a few weeks. Her brothers were in forced labor under the Hungarians who were allies of the Nazis by then. She was transported by cattle car from the ghetto to Auschwitz where she stayed for a year. And upon arrival there, she and her sisters were separated from her parents and her older sister and her sister's child. They were never seen again. At Auschwitz, Magda and her remaining sisters were selected to go to a munitions factory from which they escaped shortly before the war ended. And after liberation, Magda worked for the British Red Cross. Magda emigrated to London, England in 1946, attended art school for three years, working many, many jobs to support herself. And in 1949, she received a degree from Denver University and later obtained a master's degree in art at Columbia University. She taught art in the Miami-Dade County Schools for many years, and for over 30 years, Magda has and continues to participate in 
Many of our center's programs, such as the Speakers Bureau, the Educational Outreach Programs, especially one of her favorite student awareness days. She also serves, of course, as a judge for our annual visual arts and writing contest. And just this past February, Magda was featured keynote speaker during one of the most important Senate hearings regarding the ongoing implementation of Florida Holocaust education mandate to all Florida students. Magda Mary has two daughters, six grandchildren of which two are boys, four are girls. Magda speaks out so no one should have to experience what she did. We are so delighted to have her zooming in from Boston. We are delighted to see you, Magda. And as I'm going to ask everyone, Magda, what does Israel mean to you? What does Israel represent for you? And I know it's in your heart and in your soul. Thank you, Rosita, for introducing me. I'm honored to be in this group this afternoon with the consul from Israel. I don't see her now. Is she, is she on the panel? She's on the panel. She just, uh, she, you can't see her because uh, you're the one on display now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I thank, <coughs> I'm really very honored that she's here with us. And I think for Florida and the Southern states, it's really a great experience to have this wonderful person representing the state of Israel. We are all who are present now, the three of us, all come with a lot of baggage, a lot of history, a lot of experiences. And yet we are still so much interested in what's going on every day in Israel in relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, what happened to us in Europe, I cannot ever, ever forget. Every day I think about it or something makes me think about it. And the, the history, the parents, the family, the events, the situations, uh, otherwise in, in Europe, and we are now in the United States at the age where many people are retired and just think of having fun, but we are really very concerned about what's going on in the world because we would like to see that Israel will be able to have a secure and a, a presence and a future for the children of Israel, just like we want the United States to be always there for people to be welcomed and have a safe life. We, as little children, never remember really was very much a little child because by the time I was nine, things were changing rapidly. I went to a Hebrew Zionist elementary school my town, which was Munkac, in Czech it was Mukachevo, when we were Hungarians, it was called Munkac. There was a big Zionist community, very active. So there was a, a Zionist elementary school. Every subject was taught in Hebrew. And then my, uh, the other kids who were graduated from the elementary school ended up going to the Zionist Hebrew gymnasium, high school. I was going to go to there too. I was just on the bare able to enter when suddenly I could not go to school anymore. So I only went till I was 13 to school. Uh, after the war, when I managed to survive, after we escaped, what Rosita said about my life, it was really so, except I was in a second camp from which I, uh, my three sisters and I who survived together so luckily that we escaped from the second camp, which was in Germany near Bergen-Belsen. It was really a satellite of Bergen-Belsen. So from there, when we escaped, we have no place to go. And then we just had to wait and wait to see where is a possibility to go. Israel did not exist then yet. 
And so somehow I managed after a year after the war, managed to get to England. And I was waiting to see what's going to happen. I was lucky that I managed to get to a little, get a, some education and so forth. But my sis, one of my sisters remained in Europe. She didn't come to the United States, but then she went from Belgium to live in Israel. And I used to go every year to visit her from the United States, wherever I lived, whether I lived in New Jersey or in New York, always went to visit her to Israel. She lived in Afula first. Afula, she was working in a hospital there because she studied medicine and she was in the hematology department there. And later she was working in the Haifa hospital on Carmel. So I had always a deep connection and love to go to Israel. Some of my fellow students who went to the with me to elementary school or middle school, uh, and those who remained alive, those who managed to get to them to Palestine. And when I went to Israel, somehow we always managed to get together and meet each other. Some of the people from my hometown became even very important people in Israel, like uh, there was a gentleman whose name was Kugel, who was the head of the high school, the Hebrew high school, and then he became the mayor of Holon in Israel. I remember in 1962, I went with a group of uh, people from, from New York, New Jersey area, with a mission, with the Magen David Ado mission. It was very, very, very exciting. My, I went with my sister, my brother-in-law. Uh, Jerusalem was not yet, especially the west part of Jerusalem, available to the Jews. They couldn't go to the Western Wall. Uh, things very much have changed for the better as far as the Jews go, but every day when I see the, 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 the da danger on every side of Israel, that all that concerns me too. I cannot not pay attention to it. It's just like it's my, my history and my part and my future is involved. I thank you, uh, our wonderful guest, Casa, to talk with us. And I hope that maybe we can meet again when I come back to Florida. I wish you the best and love to you all in Florida. Thank you so much, Magda. Really, we appreciate all of your wonderful remembrances and the way you've expressed it. And you know how much I love you to pieces. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back after. I'm now going to introduce Norman Freidman. Norman Freidman was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1929. He had one younger sister and was 10 years old when the war broke out. His parents earned their living in the transportation business. They were a middle-class family. Norman attended a private Jewish school and remembers incidents of anti-Semitism from his childhood. Norman recalls in 1938, Jews from Germany and Austria were coming to Warsaw for a new life and that the community provided them shelter. Norman mentions that much of his extended family went to Palestine in 1929, but his grandparents returned to Poland. When the war started, his family loaded up wagons and headed east towards the Russian border where they remained. The family was apprehended by Russian troops and Norman's father was arrested and the rest of the family was sent back to Warsaw by rail car. Upon returning to Warsaw in 1940, Norman was no longer able to attend school. Jews were then forced to move into the Warsaw ghetto where the conditions were beyond terrible. People were sick, starving and dying and lived in some cases even worse than this, but in this particular instance with nine people, two rooms. Norman remembers the Warsaw ghetto uprising of 1943 when he 
and his mother and sister were all taken to Majdanek extermination camp. And from there, he was sent to Starzitsko concentration camp where he worked as a slave laborer in an ammunitions factory until he was then sent to Buchenwald. As the Russians got closer, he was forced on a death march. He was 15 years old when he was liberated. And after the war, Norman worked as an interpreter for Russian occupation troops for one year. After that, he was sent to Bamberg, displaced persons camp in the American zone of Germany. And in March, 1948, Norman emigrated to New York where he stayed with his aunt and uncle. He learned that his father had survived and they were reunited years later. Norman started speaking about his experiences in 1981 when he attended the first world gathering of Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem. From then on, Norman has committed his efforts to educating hundreds of thousands of students about the lessons and legacy of the Holocaust. He is the president of the Child Survivors Hidden Children of Palm Beach County. He serves on the executive board of the Holocaust Documentation Education Center and has participated in many of the March of Living programs. In 2018, Norman was presented with the Florida Freedom Award by Governor Rick Scott. Norman is married, has two daughters, two grandchildren, and we are so delighted, Norman, to welcome you this afternoon. So, Norman, what does Israel mean to you? Well, let me at the outset start that I come from a an, an very anti-Semitic country. And every, each and every day, all your first a Jew go to Palestine. That was the thing. When you come out of your mother's womb, hating the Jewish people, it remains for the rest of your life. This is where we were actually uh, brought up, up until my 10th birthday. Then, of course, the war came on. And what really happened to us is unheard of in the history of mankind. It never happened to anybody, to any person who could imagine that this tragedy can befall unto human beings? And why? What crime did I, as a 10 year old, commit to be sentenced to die and to lose my entire family? None. And this was in the name of hatred. Now, a lot of it prevails still today. But let me say that of the ashes of this tragedy of the Holocaust. The good Lord was kind enough to grant us the state of Israel. I am so very proud of its existence. Now we have a home to go to. Nobody can, I don't have to look behind my back who's going to hit me because I am Jewish. I'm proud of the fact we live through a horrible, horrible segment in our lives. And this was all in the name of hatred. Now, my life, as you well know, Rosita, is dedicated to acquaint, to make the young people of today know what this tragedy of dislike and genocide can bring. I go around to a lot of schools in Florida, sharing my experiences. And literally, first of all, the biggest uh, success that I have really encountered lately is the creation of this museum in Denia. Now we don't have to run the places in Washington and all, we have our own museum here, our own Holocaust survivors. And Rosita, you don't know from the bottom of my heart how much I am thankful for all your hard work you have done. I know it. I know it. I've known you for many years. And I know what effort you put in. And thanks to you, this museum that can be 
really visited by, by rail, the people who are on cruises, people who come use the airports, it's right in the center of it. And this is the center of our heart. That also brings us back to this beloved country of Israel. I've been on a march of the living several times, and I've seen the difference between countries and countries. And suddenly, when you see the moment that young children get off planes, get on the ground in the city of Tel Aviv and start kissing the ground, that means something. That means that we have a home. We have a future. I have a nice family there. And believe me, I've been to Israel many, many times. And the more, many times when I come back, my heart grows fonder of this country. A small country that has so many benefits to mankind throughout the globe. We are proud of it. We are proud of it. And let me say from the bottom of my heart, I could say three words. Am Israel Chai. And thank you all so very much, first of all, for inviting us. We will continue acquainting the young people for them to shed their differences between races and religions. There's no room for it on this planet. It's too small. And once they come to the realization that we have to love, love one another, we have peace and we're going to create a better life for our children and grandchildren. May God bless you all. I thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to join you all. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Norman, and God bless you. And your words always touch us so, and they are ever resounding to all who listen. Thank you, Norman. For one minute, I would like to share with some friends of mine here. I don't know if you can see this. Pull it back a little bit from from your computer screen. There you go. Norman, tell them what that is. Well, this is a jacket given to me in the concentration camp of Buchenwald in 1944. And of course, I know its destination where it's going to go, directly to Dania after I'm gone. And, uh, you know. Norman, this... could you move closer to the screen so we can see you a little bit? Yes, yes we'd you. love to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, in any event, whatever I, whatever is in my heart is most likely goes through my mouth to acquaint the children, the young people, that sometimes mankind is capable of atrocities that have to be stopped. And Norman, let me share uh, really quickly with the group a picture of you talking with students and sharing your story and educating the next generation. And as well as a picture of you being um, uh, presented at the exhibit along with your uniform right along there. Well, as I said, this is our life's ambition. Uh, and, and it's like me and my organization are dedicated to teaching. We go to the hinterlands of Florida, you know, where they don't know anything about the Holocaust, least alone they couldn't even spell the name of it. And we're reaching to Sebastian, Belgrade, Pahoki, places that you can can you can imagine. And we have the attention of the young people. Thank you, so, Norman. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'm going to move on to Judy Rodin. Let me tell you a little bit about her and her experience or Holocaust experience. Judy was born in Berkhovo, Czechoslovakia. She was six years old and had one younger brother. In May of 1944, her entire family was transported to Auschwitz with the last deportation of Hungarian Jews. 
Judy's grandmother had managed a wooden barrel factory and was able to arrange for the wife of the factory's foreman to smuggle Judy out of Czechoslovakia. Judy is the only survivor of her entire family. She became a hidden child thanks to a rescuer, a Christian woman who kept her hidden, living under false identity in a convent in Budapest till the end of the war. Judy is considered the only child survivor from her hometown of 11,000 people. In 1946, after liberation, Judy's aunt and uncle came to get her from the convent. In 1947, they emigrated to Venezuela. In 1952, Judy was admitted to the US where she lived with another aunt in Detroit, Michigan before moving to New York to live with another uncle. She later moved to Caracas, Venezuela with her uncle and aunt. And it was in Caracas where Judy met her husband. She has three children, seven grandchildren and a great grandchild is due in December, mazel tov. Judy's children moved to the United States and in 2017, when Judy was visiting for Passover, she decided to stay as the revolution in Venezuela had gotten quite bad. Judy was able to remain as she is an American citizen. Judy has noted that coming from suffering was not easy. It was harsh. She speaks to stop indifference, but has hope that as we learn from one another, there will no longer be indifference. Despite her experiences, Judy learned to find the good in every situation and flourished. She obtained a degree in philosophy at the age of 50, and she helps others with volunteer work of therapy and loving kindness. She continues to participate in all our Speakers Bureau and educational outreach programs, and also especially our Student Awareness Days. And as part of a celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month in May of 2019, Judy joined Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and senior pastor Henry Fernandez of the Faith Center for a very moving discussion of faith and eliminating hatred. Judy, thank you for being with us today. And the same question to you, what does Israel mean to you? Israel means to me, Rosita, and thank you for that introduction. Israel means to me, yes, darkness and light. At the age of 10, attending a Jewish school in Caracas, Venezuela, we were told to leave the classrooms because we are going to hear David Ben-Gurion from Israel. It was the liberation day of Israel. We heard his voice in Hebrew and certainly there was an immediate translation to Spanish. The instructions of David Ben-Gurion were, forget the past, study and work hard. This brought out whatever darkness I had had before and gave me a light, a light to live, a light to produce, a light to share, and a light to give to others when they needed it. The next event that was important in my life, in this beautiful theme of darkness to light and the meaning of Israel, I was a runner in 1986. And after a long special run, because I was quite concerned about my Aunt Susan's health, she was the one that took me out of the convent and took care of me, brought me to Venezuela along with my uncle Leslie and all my life, they were there for me and for my children as parents, 
grandparents, big time family, wisdom, whatever I needed, they were there for me. Susan that day was in the hospital because she had a coronary accident. And I was quite concerned. This is my only living relative. And as I ran and ran and ran, my grandmother that you mentioned, who actually did the job of saving me, this is my grandmother, Berta Reisman, came to me and started to speak. Judica, don't worry. We were very close, by the way. We are all together here with your mom, your dad, your little brother, your sister, your uncle Eugene, who's also on this picture, and all our family, we are well. And I want you to know, when that event occurred in Auschwitz, we knew what was happening. And we knew there was a reason for all this. The reason you did come, how she used to call me, is the state of Israel. Now we have the state of Israel. This to me was like a rebirth of all my sorrows, of all the loneliness for my family, and especially the thought, the dire thought of how they died. With this little talk from my grandmother, I felt brand new. Yes, I did come out from that darkness of sorrow to light. Friday nights, there's a beautiful song, From Darkness to Night, which is so appropriate, and I congratulate all of you for choosing this topic, Rosita. No words are sufficient to praise you because besides that fabulous museum that you created, you have made contact with thousands and thousands of high school children, public school children who had an opportunity so far to speak to our beloved survivors, friends of survivors of the Holocaust. Their faces of anticipation as they walked in moved me to no end and keep moving me because it is a fabulous, a fabulous educational method for not, in, not letting this ever to happen again because these are the young ones. These are the future. They have to know. And you are the creator of this fabulous program. Thank you for this. Cosa, dear Cosa, how beautiful to meet you. Thank you for this beautiful heartfelt card. It moved me to no end. And guess what? We have an Israeli mask. That's not, it. That's not it. Thank you for that. And I want to tell you that because of all this that you have done and are doing it still, there's a new light for everyone. No one should ever feel the darkness. And I do hope that if any of the survivors or children of those survivors are listening in, let us not think of the sorrow. Let us think of the light that we, along with you, 
Rosita, Cosa, this fabulous Carol, wow, are creating, and the entire team. Israel is our lamppost for light. We must consider that. And we must realize that we're here for a purpose in these times of lock-ins. Yes, we are locked in, but this is nothing like the lock-in that I felt during the war in that basement or dungeon or whatever it was. This is a different lock-in. This is a lock-in. We have Israel. We have all the power that Kosa just mentioned of this great nation, my grandmother's dream. They were a family of Zionists in Berehovo. And my grandmother was a very orthodox-minded lady, but also very dedicated to Zionism. So you see, it's all for us. It's all for us. I wish to thank all of these people that have made this possible. I do want to say thank you for that bio. Yes, I have seven grandchildren, but I also have two adopted grandchildren, Nati and Benny, because when we first met them, my daughter was going to marry David, their father, David Schofield. And the first thing my husband said, now we have grandchildren. This is Nati and this is Benny. I salute them also. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for listening to me. Yes, I'm Israel High to light, to light. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, so much. I hung on every one of those beautiful words about Israel and Casa and our survivors, and especially your poetic, um, I would say, presentation about the actual title of today, From Darkness to Light. And you've all brought so much light. We are so illuminated from the darkness and from the lockdown or the lock-in or whatever you want to call it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Carol, I don't know if we have any questions or I might have one. We don't have any questions yet. So to all of our uh, attendees, please, whatever question you have, post it in the Q&A or the chat. And for now, Rosita, while we wait for questions, uh, you can start us off with the first question if you'd like. Sure. I, I'm really in awe as well that you are all grandparents and I'm a grandmother as well. And my thought and question is, what do you tell your grandchildren about Israel? And do, should, Norman, do you want to begin or Magda? Let's go back to Magda. What have you or what do you or what will you? What do you want them to remember, to know, to understand? Well, because we are part of our family, spent a lot of time there. One of my grandsons, <clears throat> when he was 18, he volunteered in the Israeli army. In 19, oh, in two, I'm sorry, in 2005, he served in the Israeli army and as a volunteer, as a soldier, you know, there is a special expression that they refer to people who come to, from other countries to volunteer. And um, we, I always had a great connection and I, my family has a great connection with all the people, cousins who are still in Israel and uh, who are no longer around and so, it's very important. It's an extension of who we are because they all know where I was when I was a little girl. They wanted to see what kind of places we were from. And then they wanted to see what the other choice is 
what happened after the war, that the Jews had another home to go to. And they're very aware of that. And when I went with on the March of the Living four times with students and adults, this was really always the highlight that they could see why Israel was necessary. And all these high school students who were mostly seniors, most many, a few of them were juniors, but you could see how they changed when they saw what happened to the grandparents or the other relatives in countries like Poland or Hungary or other countries. And then when they went to Israel, they were suddenly realizing why this country, Israel, is so important to the Jews of, of the world, not just Europe, but from other countries in Africa and Asia, a lot of them. And I know that Israel helps a lot of those Jews who live there to have a Jewish home and find out what their background is and what possibilities they have to reclaim that they are Jewish, that they are in Asia or African countries. So it's, it is a, a definite connection. You can separate us. We are all related and we are aware of each other's importance. Thank you, Magda, very much. Norman, what do you tell your grandchildren? Unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm very privileged that my grandchildren have a very strong connection. We have some relatives yet in Israel. And really, there's a Yiddish saying that I quell. When I go there, my heart grows fonder of the country. Every time I come in, I see a different landscape and it's just the country blooms. And this is really an open door to each and every Jewish person on this planet that they have a home to come to and they are welcome. And this is something that uh, I, as a child, never, never encountered. Yes, my grandparents lived in Israel and with some children of theirs, but the new generation of today, you know, where on earth do you have citizens that reach their 18th birthday and they eager to run into the army? Nobody, nowhere, they're running from it, not to it, except in Israel. They cannot wait to get to the IDF. And they are really our supporters and thank God for the strength that they have and the leadership that they have that provides us as Jews to be peaceful that we have where to go. Thank you, Norman. Thank you. Judy, this is probably one of your favorite questions, what you tell your grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, coming from a history, a family history, we did not speak of the Holocaust for about 50, maybe 60 years. I was very strong on David Ben-Gurion's suggestion or mandate. And I just didn't want my children to feel bad. They probably thought I was born from a tree because there was no family, there was no mother, there was no father, there were no grandparents, just an aunt and an uncle. And so, when the grandchildren came around, the situation was pretty much the same. I did not want them to feel the sorrow, pain. But my daughter, Lisbeth, and my boys, Ronaldo and Luis, came to the rescue. Lisbeth started a film a testimonial of 32 
survivors of the Holocaust living in Venezuela. It became a four and a half hour, four hours and 20 minutes exactly owed to the survivors, their complete story. And it was, it is documented by footage in order to verify each testimonial's history so that no one could deny it. Later on, here in the United States, that film became a shorter version, an abridged version of 50 minutes or so to be shown in schools with a manual with the help of the editing of Dr. Miriam. And it's been shown to schools, it's a video. Therefore, my ch grandchildren are knowledgeable in the Holocaust, not through me, because every time I wanted to speak to them about it, I just couldn't do it. I worked on myself for a long time on this, but I guess it's really very strong. This is why I breathe peace, I talk peace, I breathe tolerance, I talk tolerance, I pray for it. It should never occur again. If I consider myself a pretty strong woman in every other sense of the word, cannot talk about it freely. I had to wait for my daughter to put it up there. So my grandchildren, God bless them, they're all wonderful, wonderful kids, never got the true story from me except a few details that I would talk about. Uh, little stories of my grandmother, my uncle, my mother, or my father, but not the true scope of suffering. I wanted to spare them. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Rosita, going on that question um, or going on the topic of praying for peace and praying for tolerance, we have a question um, from an anonymous questioner. Um, do you think that given the fact that we have the state of Israel now, is there a possibility still for a Holocaust? And I'll let you direct the questions, Rosita. You know, Norman, I think that's a question um, I'm gonna to direct to you. Do you wanna repeat it again, Carol, for Norman? Yes, so Thank Norman, you. yes, the question is, given that we do have the state of Israel, is there still a possibility for another Holocaust? Well, you know, history has a tendency of repeating. Everything is possible. But I don't think that it is going to have the same dimensions as the Holocaust under the Nazis was. There is there's some, uh, you know, there are skirmishes all over the world, but not genocidal like it was against the Jews. It was an outright case of genocide. They wanted to do away with you, no matter how. And that's, they had the Isaacs group and then everything, civilians who just came home from shooting all day long to eat at the uh, table to sit with their children and smile and laugh at them. Where does it stop? Is there a possibility? Of course there will be, but not, as I said, it's not gonna be in a case of genocide. Yesterday it was against the Jewish people. Today it could be against Buddhists, Christians, any organized religion is vulnerable. But I don't think the dimensions of the uh, tragedy that happened to us in our life. We live in very historical times. Never in the history of mankind did anything like this happen. 
and children have to be taught. They have to be taught tolerance, respect, and most of all, most of all, they have to learn how to peace, how to live in peace with one another. And Israel is an example of it. Thank you, Norman. So our next question, uh, two questions combined. Um, could you not describe, but what helped you overcome all the challenges in the terror of the concentration camps and the Holocaust? What helped you get through that horrible time in your life? Mary, Magda, do you want to answer that one? Sorry. Magda, what was yeah. it that helped you cope during the worst times of the Holocaust? What was it? The worst time in the, during the war, when we were in Auschwitz or the other camp in Tannenberg, the satellite of Bergen-Belsen, there wasn't much hope, unfortunately, because we were constantly reminded what they going to do with us and how they going to get rid of us. And there were evidence we, what we had to do, dig our own trenches or holes and they should going to shoot us and we're going to die. And the only thing that I was praying that somebody will come and save us. And we were thinking of the United States or, or England when the heavy bombers were flying over us in Germany, I was just praying that we should be staying together because I was with three sisters and that's really what saved me because we did not know what happened to our parents or my sister with the baby or the other sister or the brothers. And I think believing that there was a God who will help us helped thinking about that but it was not easy to have hope there. And it's just by miracle that we ex escaped last minute, that we survived. But the most difficult time was after the war, when it, we were already free to realize there is no home to go back to and no family to go back to and no country then to go back to. We were stateless, homeless, without parents at age 15. I just turned 15. But, but then, thank God that if we were able to be healthy in mind and body, there was a hope. And then when Israel was in the works in 1948, that gave a lot of help and a lot of hope for all the Jews who were suffering in Europe. They could see the light. They were willing to work. They were willing to create new families and life started again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I add a personal comment to that, Carol? Yes, definitely. Okay. My late father, I remember very well, he used to say, to die was easy, to put your hands up on the electric barbed wires and give it up. Uh, the last person in his family that was lasted the longest with him until the death march was his beloved father. And he told me how his father begged him, told him, instructed him to do everything he possibly could to survive, to tell it to the world, no matter what. And he said those are the things that kept him going because it would have been easy for him to just give up. So what I'm trying to say with this is that every survivor had different coping mechanisms. And, uh, and that was his, where, where that was the hope and pray that he would survive and tell it to the world. And there are others that thought of families or would dream of their mother's cooking or remember all those childhood special moments. So there were a lot of those different kind of coping. There was even some humor that they came up with in the camps to keep them going, thinking that you know they got away with something. There were acts of resistance. Uh, and what Magda talks about, which is also very important, I mean, and she says that, 
After the war, there were displaced persons camps. Many of the second generation were born in the DP camps. I myself happen to have been, as you know, in the introduction. The most incredible thing happened in these DP displaced persons camps. Uh, and they were put there survivors because as Magda said, there was no home to go back to, no family, no you know, ticker tape parades uh, waiting for everybody and celebrating their liberation. Liberation was bittersweet. But in those DP camps as an act of resistance, the largest baby boom in Jewish history happened in the DP camps. Life was reborn. There were schools again, there was music again, there were sports again, there were homes again, families um, married. Uh, they celebrated the holidays uh, in the DP camps. So that in particular, you know, for many of them was an act of resistance and defiance and uh, creating the largest baby boom in Jewish history was the real act of defiance. So again, there were different things, but thank you for that question, whoever. And Carol, our, I don't know if you want to do any more. Yeah. Um, maybe just um, so each of the speakers gets, you know, one question. So last question for Judy. Uh, we didn't have a question. It's my own personal question. You, you speak so inspiringly about lightness and what do you hope for the future? What do you envision for the future? You were speaking about tolerance and peace. What I envision for the future is all of this, all of this messaging that we're getting. When you, when one asked whether the Holocaust would repeat itself, with this media, right or left, it doesn't matter. Anything that happens, we know about it before it happens. So that is the time when we have to respond to injustice, to intolerance, to hatred, and take arms. I'm not talking about guns. Take arms, intellectual arms, to defeat all those wrongdoings. And we have to teach our children. We have to teach the parents. We have to teach everyone to be tolerant, loving to each other, and helpful. Let us be helpful to each other so that we can create a bondage, a human bondage, so that if anyone is in dire mishap, or bullying, we can attend them properly. Let us remember that a child crying on the street is our child. Let us think of him or her for, and think about their protection. This would be my message to the future for all generations, present, and future. Let us use our past for information, for experience, not to feel sorrow anymore, but to use it, to propagate it, so that this will never happen again. And yes, we can abide by tolerance, peace, love, sharing with one another, whether here or anywhere we live, whether it's a white Caucasian or a black person or an Asian person, whoever, my tears of joy opened when I saw, when I heard Kosa's story because I remember those times. I remember the Ethiopian valor and their strive to get to the state of Israel. 
we also have to think about that. That we have all these implements, so let us use them. Thank you for that question. And thank you for your response, which sums it up very well. Thank you so much. I just want to give a quick shout out. As uh, Judy mentioned, uh, the Israeli consulate did send out some masks with the Israel logo to all yeah. of our amazing Holocaust survivors. There we go. Uh, Judy, there you are. There you are. <laughs> yes, that one right there. Um, and that is to. <laughs> yes, that is to celebrate all of our amazing Holocaust survivors. You guys are a new light onto the nation. So this is a small token of appreciation. What the state of Israel is asking from you is if you could just post a picture of you wearing it and send it to, I will uh, send it to uh, Rosita or send it to me and we want to post it on our Facebook we want to post it on our social media we want to show you off so that's my uh, last tidbit yeah that's perfect Judy I love it Thank you. Uh, and with that I'll hand off the mic to Rosita and then afterwards to Casa to um, close us off thank you Judy for Thank having you. Me. Thank, thank you, you. And again, thank you to Norman and Magda and Judy. Really, uh, you are amazing. You are our light. You have always been. And we will continue to walk the path and walk the journey with you to do exactly what you were talking about, Judy, to bring light with us wherever we go and illuminate that darkness that's out there that needs to be lit. And we have the tools and, uh, and most importantly, we have you. So we thank you all very, very much for sharing your afternoon with us and really inspiring us. And especially at this time, your inspiration, it really goes further than you could ever imagine. I also just wanted to mention uh, about our traveling exhibition, uh, Israel Then and Now. It was produced, for those of you who don't know, by the Maltz Museum. It's going to be with us until March 31st, 2021. We are in perfect shape for any visitors. We have done everything as per the Broward County CDC regulations, all the sanitization, you name it. Um, if you are interested, we are available for appointments because in the, under these circumstances, it's appointment only from Monday to Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3.30. Uh, we certainly hope to see you. You can go online or you can contact Erin. I know that uh, Carol had just put her email address in the chat and maybe we could repeat that and uh, we will get you scheduled. Again, um, we thank you so much again, uh, Carol Casa. Uh, you really brought it full circle for that time in Israel in meeting many of the Ethiopians and getting to know you now uh, after so many years and seeing you as consul, deputy consul, it is an inspiration in and of itself. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless all of you. And in Yiddish, I will say, and I'll translate, Zolz Menur sein gesinnt und stark bis hinten in 20, which means you should all only be well and healthy till 120. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, um, Magda, Norman, Judy. You are your story is so inspiring, and I want to tell everyone that Israelis exist to say never again. We are strong. We are a strong nation, a strong country. We have a strong allies. Uh, the uh, the relationship, I mean, between Israel and the, the United States is based on shared values. So our friendship of America and Israel, it's so important. And we are so proud of you and we are really appreciate the kind words that you said. Yes, the state of Israel re-established, uh, re-established our independence to be a strong nation among the nations. And to say to the all over the world, to every Jew in the world, in the world, never again. And this is a, a, the birthright house of every Jew and Israel is a democratic state that respects human rights and freedom and democracy for everyone and every citizen. So 
I'm really happy to have this event with you. It's such an honor. Stay safe and thank you very much. And all of you, call Hakavod to you, Kasa. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>